Hi, um, I'm Sam. Welcome to the next in the series of Labor History, dealing with the 50s and 60s. Um, there's a joke commonly said that uh, Australia's 60s were in the 1970s. So if, if you're familiar with US history, imagine this as a long extended 1950s up until about 1964 in the US model. Um, last week we ended on a Labor movement divided between the Communist Party of Australia, the Labor Party and the newly forming Democratic Labor Party which is also called the Groupers, a Catholic right-wing movement who controlled the industrial groups and I'd like to correct myself from last week when I said that the CPA organised them, they were in fact organised by the Australian Labor Party to intervene in unions and then taken over by the Catholic right. Um, now, all three of these movements were controlling and fighting over control of different unions. We also ended with Menzies' forgotten people, people who, to Menzies' impression, were not workers but had been forgotten by the ALP government of the time, getting him elected. But we're going to look into detail into who these forgotten people are. Um, this week we're going to deal with anti-communism, wages, consumer society, housing, full employment, the Mount Isa strike, mass migration and social movements. But to correct myself again from last week, I forgot to mention the culture in Australia during World War II. I mentioned the rent changes, rents going up and up and up, but what I didn't mention was Australians reacting to Americans as vastly culturally different, as not British, as not Australian, and this impacting on them. And also in the military cities, the sexual freedoms that developed in the war moment, um, which did change Australian working class culture, but didn't change the ruling class's impressions of life. So to start this week, um, Let's talk about who Menzies' forgotten people were. Now, he's mainly talking about bank staff and doctors and pharmacists and nice, respectable workers who aren't members of unions. But he conceives of them as part of a national community, um, no longer a British community and not really an Australian community in the kind of parochial national sense, but a member of his community, ordinary people, the kind of people who John Howard appeals to, the kind of people who Shorten's trying to appeal to, this kind of neutral centre that the politicians would like to imagine. But these people weren't all middle-class doctors and doctors' wives, as the saying goes. These were ordinary workers who had rejected the labour movement for good reasons. They'd rejected the uselessness of the unions. They'd rejected the failure of the unions to impact on their working lives significantly. They'd rejected a union movement that had rejected them by failing to organise them adequately, as in the case with the um, bank workers. But these people also had a dream about how Australia should be configured, and their dream wasn't socialism. I think their dream is best summarised as the good life or the easy life. And any working class activist who tells them off for having this dream is bloody stupid because it is a good dream. It is a dream of meaningful work that people recognise and that you're recognised for, a living that is stable and secure, the ability to control your own housing, the ability to live free from want and medical strife. These people set up a community, along with the rest of the Australian working class after the war, that was based off these material achievements. I mean, the number one organiser of working class people after the war was stuff like the bowling club movement, where you had to appear in a white hat and a white dress or a white suit and appear to be respectable and get really drunk on the cheap inside the club and hang out, proving that you are like those doctor's wives of the 1920s who bowled, to prove that you as a working class person are in some way real because of the kind of leisure you have access to. We're talking about quarter acres. Now remember, these quarter acre blocks are shit heaps on floodplains out the back of nowhere with no roads and no sewers and no leco and gas on, which people built up by stealing bricks. I've heard of people who walked home with a refractory brick from a furnace, one brick each shift every day and built their house out of it. We're talking about people living in fibro kit homes made of pure, safe asbestos. We're talking about living under a tin roof with no electricity in barely more rooms than a terrace, but actually controlling your space. 
and having the ability to have a backyard garden, which is part of the quarter-acre dream. These are dreams built off the vast poverty of the working class before the war, and they are as sensible as every person having a smartphone in their pocket today. They're as sensible as every worker in Nigeria having at least a Nokia phone. These are the achievements people should be living with at a minimum. Now I'd argue that Fibro was shit and everybody should have been in double brick. But that wasn't what they could get. They could get Fibro on the cheap. They could get tin roofs on the cheap. They could set up and build slightly more and more of a house and then bitch and moan to the council for years until the electricity put on or until they got paved roads. These are people fighting over their ordinary working life, but they've lost the organisational fight that was happening up until 1949 last week. This isn't phrased as better houses for workers in general by a united movement. This is individuated workers or small groups or families or communities building their own stuff. Now, I've read in communist memoirs that the communists did exactly the same thing. This is not unique to a right-wing sector of workers. The good life, the easy life, was a generalised dream. And why could this happen? Because of a long boom, a 25-year-long economic boom that took the Communist Party and the hard left of the Labor Party by surprise, with no shortages, with full employment, with an increasing consumer consumption in new commodities that weren't experienced before the war. Now, I think in value terms, the amount of value going to the working class dropped in this period in Australia. But in terms of what people could consume, it went up, not dramatically like in the 1970s, which we'll deal with next week, but it went up and people experienced this as a good life. And the question is, with the post-war manufacturing boom, why make cars in Australia? We're not dealing with an environmental socialism where people go, well, we do need some cars for some purposes, we may as well build them rather than shipping them with diesel ships all over the world. The government wanted to build cars. This is the ALP government before Menzies because they hoped that a car manufacturing industry would allow them to build tanks in a war. And the Menzies government had the same impression. The post-war boom needs to be viewed in this, in this sense that the capitalist class internationally in the white countries were aware of the presence of communism as an alternative to their own rule and wanted to avoid it and wanted to buy off first world workers quite deliberately. Now, it also helped that they had an economic system called Keynesianism, which encouraged them in this, and they had the experience of World War II showing them that a semi-planned economy could still buy off capitalists, as well as buying off workers while remaining capitalism. But the experience for the workers wasn't that simple. Having access to full-time jobs in full employment meant a number of things which happened. But before we jump onto them, it's also worth talking about what the rich in Australia built. They built nuclear projects. They built vast electricity and water projects. Now, these vast electricity and water projects did have a benefit for ordinary workers. Electricity was remarkably cheap compared to before the war. But this was electricity for aluminium production, like at um, Fassifern in Newcastle which was dirty as all hell and people died from cancer living next door to it. They wanted the electricity for production, but the side effect was we got electricity. They also built universities and technical colleges. Now, this might sound remarkable until you remember that they'd expanded the secondary school system during and after the war up until about 1960, the secondary school system was expanding. And they viewed this as a way to stop the job shortage amongst white collars and to cheapen white collar labour. They saw the same thing about technical labours which required college education like nursing or teaching at the state level and they saw the same thing with the universities with what was viewed then as professional or, or avocational, the A in front of it means that you're rich rather than a plumber, <coughs> and they were aware of what they were doing in cheapening labour generally. Some of their other initiatives include ripping all the trams up from Australian cities to destroy the tramways unions and force people to buy cars. Some of their other initiatives involve closing down long distance freight rail to allow toll or TNT couriers to dominate long distance trade with country towns. So they are very, very clever about it. 
and part of the post-war boom is this new system of rep repressing and oppressing workers. Part of it is they also had to destroy the political left with anti-communism. Now, this was part of a worldwide movement, as we saw last week, with ASIO, with the organised Z Asian, named and built by Americans in our country. But it also involved a very, very vocal attempt to ban the Communist Party, first by an act of parliament, then by a high court challenge to that act of parliament, where the Communist Party won, and supported by, I believe, Evert, the ALP major intellectual and politician. And then he went to referendum over it, and the referendum was closely lost, in part because the ALP viewed an attack on the Communist Party as being unconscionable because they'd be next. Now, it's worth briefly dealing with the Communist Party because at the start of this period of the 50s and 60s, they are the big side of the working class movement's um, revolutionary conception. After the ban, they lost numbers quite significantly to 1960 despite a small peak in the mid-50s. Their union work became more and more bureaucratic and more and more controlled by the party centre. It's hard to deny them this when they've just been made illegal in peacetime and they're shedding numbers, but it became worse despite the rank-and-file activists still being quite good. Their other work was concentrated in the Union of Australian Women, which, like the Quarter Acre Block, was a very anti-feminist view of women's rights. This was a better homes and gardens for the communist or left-leaning lady to raise your children better and healthier for the peace movement and for the revolution. <coughs> they also came up in institutions like the Melbourne University Labor Club, where they intervened far more effectively than the Labor Party. And the background of the student movement is in the late 40s and early 50s with very, very nice people like this. It's then rejected in the 1960s by students, which we'll get to. Also, what happened to the Communist Party was probably three big things that influenced them over the period. First of all, in 1956, there was a workers' revolution in Hungary for communism against the Soviet Union and against the um, anti-worker section of the Hungarian Communist Party. This was crushed by Soviet tanks and the Australian Communist Party ejected a whole bunch of dissenters over this as well as Khrushchev's secret speech. These people have been yelled at in small rooms in the early 2000s for splitting the party in the 50s. The rancour and ire from people who dispute every other movement of communism, which we'll briefly touch on over this 56 issue, is quite great. Just to clarify here, um, what you're saying is that um, the people who were expelled were the people... Um, who supported the crushing of the Hungary Revolution. No, the people who were expelled were the people who supported the Hungarian Revolution. Because the Australian Communist Party was one of the few communist parties in the world which split from the Moscow line. That's 68 over Czechoslovakia, which we'll deal with in two uh -huh. ticks. Uh -huh. um, but well observed. So this is quite interesting, which when we get to it, the Australian Communist Party was against tanks by the late 60s, but was for tanks in 1956 which is one of the reasons why old communists are often called tankies by the rest of the left. <laughs> Not because they're um, a water tank out the back draining off the roof. The second thing that happened to the Communist Party of Australia is it didn't know whether to go with China or the Soviet Union when they started disputing and actually warring over minor outlying imperial areas which they both shared. The Communist Party in Australia started having to think in different ways because it didn't know which way it was going to go. Then you get the Communist Party of Italy, which maintained a separate branch in Australia, which the Australian Communist Party then had to work with. And then in 1968, tanks roll into Prague, where a Czechoslovak communist government had been reformed by its own members and the working class and was building workers' councils in a way I'd identify as moving towards a revolutionary situation. Basically, when workers start controlling their own work and the Communist Party's on side, and Brezhnev sends in the tanks in 1968, and as previously mentioned, the Australian Party splits over this, and the people ejected this time are the ones who like the tanks rolling over workers. So it's a very interesting party, but the main thing that I want you to get out of this is their standard form of action in Sydney was this. 
Come to the demo at Wynyard Station Park on Friday night and bring your placard to protest against war or the execution of the Rosenbergs in the United States or the nuclear bomb or for peace. Come to Wynyard Park. Now this reminds me oh so very much of come to Town Hall Station on Friday night to show your placards. What was the rest of the Labor movement doing? Well, the Catholic right-wingers, who were on the whole working class, though they were following a very anti-working class leadership and line, were busy organising and capturing metals. Now, this is the metal trades, the unions which cover metals entirely, which were heavily fought over by communists and ALP and the DLP group of Catholics in this period, back and forth. But they put a lot of effort into metals, with really good activists who on the ground would back you in a dispute. They wouldn't take you out, but they would back you in a fight with the boss. So these aren't slacker right-wingers like we know today. These are boss-fighting right-wing scum of the working class. It got so bad in Victoria that the ALP there split in two, and the ALP split in two nationally. And this is one of the reasons why the ALP was in the wilderness until 1972, when Whitlam was elected, because the Catholic right would transfer their votes to the Liberal Party and the National Party and ensure Labor didn't get in. What was the ALP doing while it was in the wilderness for all these years? Now, there was still genuine variety in the ALP and the unions because you had to fight to win. They were still, to some, in some sense, democratic, even though more and more bureaucratised. But their difficulty was with union cooperation with other factions in the 50s and 60s and also outside of states like New South Wales. They were permanently in the political wilderness. So one thing you see is the ALP in New South Wales passes laws which would later be passed in 1972 throughout the entire period. And it's worth thinking about this in terms of 20 years of repressed economic and social and political demands held down for so long that in 1950 you could see that Australian censorship had to end. But then again in 1985 we could see that marijuana should have been legalised. And we have been held down for a similar length of time. Now just before we move on I want to talk about the people before the new left who were on the left. Now, there were small Trotskyite groups in the period, but the more interesting groups is Outlook by Helen Palmer, daughter of Vance and Nettie Palmer, which was an independent left-wing communist paper published after 1956, from early 1957 onwards, which had as its main focus Aboriginal rights and Papua New Guinea rights. The journal Arena was also formed in this period, another independent Marxist journal. Um, and we also saw... Um, splits in the Communist Party into Maoists and pro-Soviet Union tankies and anti-Soviet Union Communist Party members. We also saw the Sydney push of a bunch of relatively well-off Sydney University students. My God, it's 20 minutes in. We <laughs> saw the Sydney push where a bunch of Sydney University students were interested in a culture they weren't able to live. So if that's perhaps the social situation at the beginning of the period, I'll go through the rest of my talk with a rapidity that will startle me. <laughs> the only way to keep the boom going was rage, wage restraint by governments, unions and workers, and this was broadly agreed to by the unions and governments. How this happened in practice was the government arbitration commissions, government arbitration court, later to commission as a result of a trial in this period, um, started restricting the inflation boosts. So in this period, if you were earning $100 in one week and then inflation raised this to 110, the court would quarterly adjust that up to 110. So you're lagging a quarter behind inflation, but your wages kept pace with inflation. Up until they removed the basic wage inflation adjustment in the early 50s and then the margin adjustment in the early 60s. Then they slammed them together and said that the courts would adjust wages on an as-is basis. And year after year, people went in for a basic wage fight or a margin wage fight and had to fight it all over again with the court. But they kept wages down through this technique. They also kept wages down by the communists and the ALP and the group is all telling people, no, don't go out on strike, that'll be illegal, we'll have to pay fines to the court. 
We'll talk about fines in a little bit. The other thing which was happening was, which we, was we had open mass migration. Now, initially this started under the ALP with a very small section of um, continental European migration, in particular 2,000 Jewish migrants to Australia in the immediate post-war era. But Menzies picked this up by bringing in anti-communist refugees. So many of the people who were first called refos were in fact anti-communist refugees. Now, many of them were just Finns who wanted to get the hell out of Finland. But there was an anti-communist streak. And then it broadened and broadened and broadened and became the mass of Greek and Yugoslav and Italian and Polish workers who just wanted to earn higher wages and a number of other people. This mass open migration is in some way a proof of the fact of full employment. And I'd actually say by forcing capitalism to grow in Australia through forced, the government forcing capitalists to reinvest, plus mass migration, the migration assisted in capitalist growth and forced them into a growth scenario. This is also the period where we see the equal wage fight, but the way in which centralised wage determination generally happened was the metal trades would fight their boss locally and illegally until they were threatened with fines from the court. Then they stopped, waited a bit, went out again, until the boss raised their wages above award. Then they'd go to the courts, get the above award section certified and introduced into their margin, their special bonus payment for being a steel worker of a particular kind. Then everybody else could apply to get the metal trades margin adjustment. So because they could fight, they did. They fought, they won on the black, then they won on the books, then everybody else with a union secretary who can at least send a letter to a bloody court, and some of them didn't, they were that bad, gets that same wage increase. Now, part of this involved a massive growth in white-collar employment, in banking, in insurance, in bureaucracy, both corporate and government, in teaching, in nursing, in engineering, in architecture. But white collars, because their unions on the whole were pretty shit, didn't apply for this. And because of, um, because of a number of factors related to proletarianisation, which I've talked about previously, namely you get new bodies in to do the job and it's their first job as a white collar and everybody else was blue collar in my family, I don't mind working for less than somebody else or I don't even know that I'm working for less than somebody else. And so their relative wages decrease. They're also not able to fight for overtime or above award payments like the blue collars were. And so the relative... This is the period when the white and blue collars start coming together from the late 1930s through to the 1970s. And they drop from being three times the average blue collar, so the average white collar and three times the average blue collar, down towards... Um, merely 125% of the average blue collar. Now, this caused an increase in white collar unionisation. It caused the white collars to form both a government um, central union committee like the ACTU and a non-government central com union committee called um, the Australian Council of Salaried and Professional Associations. Now, AXPA went to the court and said, we'd like you to triple our wages to make up for the lack of wage growth in the period, and the court laughed them out. This is around 1959. But from that day onwards, they started applying for the metal trades margin increases <laughs> for their members. Now, these white-collar associations in AXPA were, on the whole, centre or left. There's only really one white right-wing group, which is Federated Clerks. And most of their best union organisers and leaders are ALP, ALP Left and Underground Communist. So Teachers Federation was full of underground communists. Um, they didn't, in fact, bias the Teachers Federation towards a communist line. Their communist mission was organise a strong union that won for its members and started thinking of itself more as a union than as a white-collar association. Um, this is very different to what the professional engineers did. They went to the courts and said, triple our wages because we've got degrees, and the court said, ha, 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 no, let's have five years of hearing. And then the council professional engineers said, um, basically, we're going to turn your sewer systems off unless you settle. And the court settled. 
and they got <laughs> massive wage increases, which didn't flow on to architects or employee doctors or employee lawyers as fast as, say, the metal trades bonus flo f flowed on. Um, what were other unions doing? And I'm going to be very tight because I know that I'm already 25 minutes in. So, the BLF, the Builders Labourers Federation, which was run by communists and Maoists, had figured out that the way you win people to a union is you find out what they're missing and win it for them first. So, Builders Labourers had to walk away from work on their own clock to defecate or to urinate and went home dirty because there were no showers. And the BLF won shitters and showers and then wages and conditions and then safety and politics. And because they were a winning union, people trusted them and trusted them to go on into greater and greater fights, which perhaps we'll talk about in the 70s. But the strength of the BLF was the most immediate needs of the workers which were unserviced. The MUA in this period was faced with a different problem. They'd got rid of the bullpen from the 1930s where you turned up and the boss goes, you, and you, and you look healthy. Nah, you're sick today. You don't have a lunchbox, not you, him. And finally agreed to get rid of the scab union which had been formed by the bosses in the 1930s by merging. It was a very long, hard fight to get militants in, the, in what was then the Waterside Workers' Federation to accept the scab union as sin but they were already a declining trade. And so they agreed to do it. They still kept fighting, but they weren't growing. This is where the Mount Isa strike in 65 comes in. Now, Mount Isa was organised by Ted Mackey, an ex-IWW and a yank off the docks. I think, based on Ted Mackey's own descriptions of his life, that he was a man who had periodic, intimate, domestic relationships with men. Um, that's as far as I'm willing to go because he doesn't talk about lovers, but he talks about his best mate, who he travelled across the world in a yacht to get to Australia with, which is a great deal of intimacy. So he's a man without a family. He's a man who goes out to Mount Isa, which is a company town. It is blue sky mining company town. The union is right wing and barely functional. Ted Mackey learns that the Finns on the site are real workers, the Finnish workers. He's willing to talk to them. He's willing to treat them as human beings. He's willing to organise with them. And then he goes into the union meeting on a Saturday morning and takes it over and starts running fast union meetings. Comrades, can we get through this rapidly so we can all get on the piss? Yes, Ted. And he starts fighting until Mount Isa locks him out. And the entire Queensland and Australian left of the labour movement, of the trade unions movement, supports Ted Mackey in this. Now, I think that they eventually kind of half lost to the company. But this shows what one anarchist can do, because Ted Mackey is a bit of an anarchist. His motto was, keep on punching. What one good anarchist can do in the right situation by bringing in the possibility of real organisation and real solidarity and being competent at meeting procedure. <laughs> Ted Mackey is one of the reasons why right-wing unions in Australia are so heavily bureaucratic to prevent rank and filers taking over like Ted did. Now, around 1965 is when you get something happening above and beyond the Wynyard demo. You get Freedom Riders facing off against white towns where the World War II Memorial Swimming Pool excludes Aboriginals, where the front bar excludes Aboriginals, where people are inspired by the freedom rides in the United States about a very different racist issue, and so start taking it out there. And this kind of thing, and the student sense overseas, revivifies student movements, which were far better than the ones today, but <coughs> um, Melbourne University Labor Club was very much a suit and tie wearing body of communists and left Labor socialists. Now this new movement bypasses the old left. The new feminists bypass the Union of Australian Women. The, in the mid to late 1970s, the 
homosexual legalization movement bypasses the old homophile movements and the old um, cottaging movements in Sydney. The students, because they've grown under Menzies, Menzies built universities for Australia. If you want to know who made Australia's universities, it's basically Menzies. And Menzies forced the states to build colleges on the same model, which later became the newer universities. These students in these new colleges and universities find it very easy to take over their student association and form or reform the Australian Union of Students as a more interesting union. But the thing that I question about this is, was it students or was it youth in general? I think it's more likely youth in general. All that 20 years of repressed social and political and cultural reform, the fact that you can't watch films, the fact that you can't import books, the fact that everything's censored and monitored by the import agencies, sounds a lot like today, bubbled up and bubbled over. And it forced a lot of the left movements to change. So Nick Oroglass in Balmain by this time was organising council elections. And he took direct action to shut streets off with way gates to stop trucks rocketing through at night. Don Dunstan in South Australia um, single-handedly created the Australian film industry from cultural pressure from below and from his own unique characteristic. Now, if you want to look up Don Dunstan online, make sure you get a colour photo because his tight pink shorts are a wonder and <laughs> caused controversy in the very fuddy-duddy South Australian <laughs> Parliament. Now, Don Dunstan might have been a man with ideas and on our side, and Whitlam had these kind of people like Jim Cairns, who went to one of the first environmentalist hippie movement happenings in Australia. But Whitlam was not Don Dunstan and Whitlam was not Jim Cairns. Whitlam was whipped to the left by the Labor movement. And this whipping came out of the new youth movements, the emergence of an Aboriginal movement of strength, the emergence of white and blue collar peak unions which were fighting, regardless of their left-right factionalism, because the groupers had faded away gently as a political force in Parliament, even though they still controlled some unions. And it all came to a head when the blue-collar unions kept fighting for higher wages, kept getting fines, stopped the strikes, paid the fines, went on. And Clary O'Shea, who I believe was a Maoist, a Maoist from Melbourne in the Tramways Union, who was the secretary at the time, said, stuff this, I'm not paying. And he got jailed. And Melbourne came out on general strike behind him. And a few days into his jailing... Somebody, some rich benefactor, probably American, paid his fines for him. And from that time on, unions didn't have to pay their fines and could fight wildly for wages and had broken the stricture of the fines and the courts upon them. So let's talk about our wins briefly before I sum up. Well, as I sum up, before I tell you about next week. The left had managed to achieve generational reproduction despite cultural difference. We ended up dealing with the same set of diverse issues as at the beginning of the period as at the end, but with far more diverse populations and organisations. There was democracy within the revolutionary left, even if it meant the difference between the tankies, the, so the Moscow line, the Australian line, or the Maoist line, or some of the trots, or those few anarchists, some of whom are around today, so I won't name them. Anarchism was reorganising for the first time seriously. We broke the penal powers, which had been that system of fines that kept unions from fighting all the way. We broke the wage freeze, which they'd tried to keep down on us and had been moderately successful for for 20 years. We broke 20 years of held up social change and forced governments to implement them. We kept full employment going. We forced Labor to implement some of our demands. And we know what the rest of the state did to Whitlam when he was forced by us, but too chicken to rely upon us. But more on that next week. Next week, consumer culture in the 70s and 80s, buying people off with plastic instead of wages, the return of unemployment and the return of super crappy Labor governments. Thank you. <laughs>